On behalf of the Lover's Lane Foundation and the Owen Linton Lecture Series, I want to welcome you to the 2022 Owen Linton Lecture Series. We are so glad you are here. I think as many of you know, Arch and Babs Owen, the late Arch and Babs Owens, are the founders of this lecture series. But more than that, Arch and Babs, more than anyone, are also responsible for the very existence of the Lover's Lane Foundation. Babs and Arch joined Lover's Lane in 1955, so 67 years ago. I think if Babs and Arch were alive today, I think they would tell you, because Babs has actually told me this many times, that they have many good memories here at Lover's Lane, very many. Last month would have been Babs' 104th birthday, but we lost her this past December, and we really miss her dearly. We're honored today that her daughter-in-law, uh, Linda Owen, and her long-term caregiver, Meredith Simpson, are here. Would y'all please stand and be recognized? You know, I, I didn't know Arch, but I have so many good memories of seeing Babs here at the Owen Linton Lecture Series, usually sitting right there where y'all are. And usually she was boasting about how old she was. I remember so many good things about her, many lunches together and coffees together. But I think one of my fondest memories was one year she was sitting right there and I was sitting beside her. And we kind of had a speaker that time, a very good speaker, but a speaker that was a little out of the box, a little edgy. And on Thursday, at the end of the benediction, she leaned over to me and she said, who picks these speakers? <laughs> I told her Pastor Stan picked the speakers. <laughs> Well, after our church moved to this present location, Arts began thinking about how we needed a foundation, primarily to help maintain all of our new buildings at this location. And today, um, you know, the foundation has about 24, $25 million in it, and the majority of it still goes to support our facilities. Arts spearheaded in 1981 the actual formation of the foundation. Arch and Babs actually took turns serving as the chairman of the board or the chairperson of the board, alternating back and forth to comply with our bylaw restrictions that no one could be the chairman more than two years. And the foundation never looked back from that and we've grown to where we are today, thanks in large part to Arch and Babs. Then in 1985, Arch and Babs launched the idea for a lecture series to be held during Holy Week. And they endowed a permanent endowment to fund what became known as the Owen Linton Lecture Series. And for many years now, this endowment has funded this very day and Wednesday and Thursday, featuring one or more speakers on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of Holy Week. This year, we're in for a treat. Bishop Harvey is our speaker, and she's going to bring to us a very good message, and she's following sort of the theme that we've been on in our seven-week sermon series of diving deep into a relationship with God. I'm pretty sure after the benediction this Thursday, if Babs were here, she'd probably lean over to me and say, whoever picked this speaker did a good job. And of course, I would answer her, well, I, well you know, I did. Actually, like so many things in our church and with our foundation, much of the credit for all the good things that have happened to us and that have led the foundation to where we are now over the last 20 plus years, much of that credit should go to our senior pastor, Pastor Stan. And that includes with regard to selecting our speaker this week. So let's get started. I've asked Pastor Gondi to give us an opening prayer and Dee Dee's going to read our scripture verses, and then Stan will introduce Bishop Harvey. Goni. God is good. And all the time. That is coming also from Pastor Stan. So let us bow our heads in prayer. 
Dear Lord, we come before you today in this place where we see your presence. Your presence, dear Lord, that gives us the assurance that we are running, we are fighting, and we are keeping our faith because of that presence. Dear Lord, we thank you for those whom you inspired years back that we are today celebrating the things that you have inspired and that is inspiring us to keep on keeping on with your ministry. Help us today, Lord, as we have a lot of questions in our heads, asking ourselves about how to navigate through the things of our life. Answer some of our questions. And we know that you are ready to do that through the music, through the word for today. We thank you for who you are. We bless you, dear Lord. And as we gather in this place, we are also reminded that you love humanity so much that you are ready to die for us. And for that reason, Father, we are gathered in this place celebrating because of your love. We thank you. At some point, Jesus, as he was praying, his disciples came to him and say to him, teach us how to pray. And as he was teaching his disciples, he said to them, when you pray, you say, our Father, who art in heaven, how Lord be thine, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On behalf of Lovers Lane, if you are visiting with us today, we want you to know that you matter to us. You are welcome. And we thank you for choosing to be with us in this service today. Today we will be reading from Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 28. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that, he answered them well. He asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher, you have truly said that. He is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all your heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dee Dee and, and uh, Goni and Paul. And especially thank you to Linda and Meredith for being here today and, uh, and representing the Owen family. We love that. Thank you so very much. You know, I want to say to all the clergy types who are here and all the staff types who are here that um, Bishop uh, Cynthia Fiaro Harvey is going to meet with us at 1030 on Thursday. So let's help pass the word. Now that's for clergy and staff members, and anyone else who wants to come, but especially the clergy and staff members, right? And uh, we appreciate that so very much, adding that into your busy schedule, Bishop. 
I want to introduce our speaker. I'm very excited about um, uh, Bishop Harvey being with us today. She has been in Louisiana for an extended term, 10 years, just like many of the bishops in our connection, since we haven't been able to have a general conference and uh, a, a, judicial, a, a jurisdictional conference. She has been serving in Louisiana for 10 years. And in that 10-year period of time, she has 486 congregations and 118,000, 119,000 nearly, um, members of the United Methodist Church in the state. And she's been through probably three or four or five hurricanes. I don't know. But it's been a lot in 10 years. And she has led so incredibly well. I can't imagine anyone being better fit for Louisiana at such a time as has been than one who was elected to the Episcopacy from UMCOR, where she was a Deputy General Secretary there in the United Methodist Committee on Relief, which is one of the most beloved um, uh, aspects of our denomination that we have. Always, wherever there is um, an emergency need throughout the world, UMCOR is there on our behalf. I do want to say uh, a little bit more about her ministry in Louisiana. Uh, she encourages that vibrant and alive and vital spirit among congregations. And she models that. If you know uh, Bishop Harvey, you know uh, that she models that vitality in all that she does. She is, um, is contagious in that vitality. And she encourages the churches to look beyond themselves and to keep their eye focused on the edge where God is at work. She served as a pastor, um, an associate pastor at Foundry United Methodist Church and for 12 years was at the Great Memorial Drive United Methodist Church in the Houston area uh, before going for a couple of years with the Texas Annual Conference in leadership development role and then going to UMCOR and then being elected and aren't we glad that we elected um, her to be part of our episcopacy. Her leadership has been outstanding. For the past two years, she served as um, the president of the Council of Bishops. That's the head bishop, in case you want to know. Not the pope, but the head bishop. And uh, in, in that capacity, or before that capacity, she served for four years as the uh, secretary of that, of that council. And so she is recognized literally globally among United Methodists for the leadership that she has provided and still provides um, in, in a great degree to get today. Um, I'm not going to tell you when she was born, even though it's here, but she and I are two weeks apart, okay? <laughs> We're both May babies, right? Uh, in the same year, but I'm not going to go there. Her husband, Dean Allen Harvey, uh, they were married the same year Tammy and I were married, 1981. And uh, they have a daughter, Elizabeth Grace. We have a daughter, em Emily Grace. But enough of those comparisons. What I want to tell you about the two of them in marriage is I want to tell you that they love to cook and they love good food. And in fact, I'm even told that Dean is an excellent chef and Cynthia is at his side as a sous chef taking care of the cleanup duty. I don't know what that means. But I do know what it means to, uh, to be a chef of sorts. So I have connections to a Pickling Parson guy and he wants to give you, Dean, a cookbook. And it says, Dean, enjoy these stories and recipes. Turn your shelf expertise a bit to pickling, canning uh, side, and you'll be great. And we'll have one more thing we can talk about, the pickling parson. So we want to thank you for being here, both of you. Because coming to us, um, I think, as a couple in ministry for these years and continuing in the capacity um, in this role as a, an Episcopal leader, is so invaluable at this time. We know that our church is in the midst of some challenges. We need strong leadership. And the one who will be preaching for us today is the epitome of strong Episcopal leadership. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I hope it's okay for me to stand here. Uh, pulpits and lecterns are not kind to little people. So uh, this way I can see you and hopefully we can make uh, some eye contact here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Stan, for it. It's always so uncomfortable uh, when people introduce you, but um, I am so thankful uh, to be here, and thank you to Lovers Lane, to Stan Colton, to Paul Ditto, and the entire staff. We have just been welcomed with such extravagant hospitality that I'm just grateful for all of you. And while just today I've met a part of the Owens family, I have not met um, all of the Owens. I'm grateful for this opportunity and for the vision uh, that your family has had to establish uh, the, the foundation and this lecture series, the extravagant generosity, and of course their legacy. Uh, for that, I am thankful and thankful to be here today. So I do bring you greetings from Louisiana. Uh, we are on the cusp of hurricane season, starts the end of May, but we're going to not try to look that way. Um, we were in the cone of uncertainty seven times last year. You know what that is. And, and uh, we were talking about writing books today, uh, Donna Whitehead and I, and I, I, have, um, I, I don't really have a book in me, but I do have a title. And my title, and my friend who's a writer says that's the hardest part is choosing a title. And my title is Leading from the Cone of Uncertainty. Like that covers a lot of ground. So uh, greetings from Louisiana where we're always in recovery from one hurricane or another. And I also bring you greetings from the Council of Bishops. Uh, the Council of Bishops has been quite busy, but we're going to set that aside for now. And we're going to focus on this holiest of weeks. You know, more is known about this week in Jesus' life than any other. But unlike Advent and the Christmas story that we know a few more things about, we don't have figurines in our home that remind us of this week. There are no shepherds, no camels, no magi, no drive through nativity comparison or equivalent. There's no caroling. There are no yard displays, and bunnies don't count. Bunnies don't count. Now, we do wear crosses, and there's plenty of art. But this week is different. This week is more about feeling, about reflection, and about emotion. Now we do have more Lenten hymns in our United Methodist hymn book than we do Advent hymns. And I'm a liturgical nerd, just so you know that. Uh, and so I don't believe in singing Christmas hymns until Christmas. So I always struggle uh, during Advent. We don't have that problem during Lent. I think music leads us in this season more beautifully than anything else. So thank you for your leadership. The entire Lenten season is about reflection, about renewal, about reversal, upside downness, and of course, eventually, resurrection, the ultimate reversal. Now one other liturgical pet peeve of mine is that you cannot go from Palm Sunday straight to Easter. You can't do it. You miss the point if you do that. So I'm thankful that you're here today for this journey because I believe you must make the entire Holy Week journey. I think that's because of what is ingrained in me with my Roman Catholic roots and my family roots, we were in church every day during Holy Week. As I got older, my job as a child was to walk my grandmother, who had lost her sight, to church every day before I went to school. We didn't own a car until I was in high school. Walking was our only mode of transportation, so my abuelita and I would walk those rough 
West Texas Roads to our little parish, St. Thomas Catholic Church. It's about three blocks from our home. Unfortunately, that beautiful little church is now closed. Now, did I mention that we were in church every day during Holy Week? You know, I didn't appreciate it back then. Stations of the cross. And oh my God, we kneeled at every station, really. And then there was communion every day. Every day we were in church. Some days were very quiet and simple days of reflection, like Wednesday, when not much is said about Jesus, although there must have been something going on to prepare for the Passover feast, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. So you may be asking why I have chosen the Gospel of Mark. I agree with the scholars that it's the first gospel written, but I really like Mark's economy of words and his urgency. Mark constantly points us toward the future. Three times Jesus predicts his death, and the disciples still don't get it. Mark foreshadows the resurrection at the transfiguration narrative. And in all of these stories, Mark is succinct, and he gets to the point quickly. You know, I remember when I was a student at Perkins, and I asked Dr. Billy Abraham if I could write my credo in bullet points. Short and succinct and to the point. And of course, he said no. <laughs> but I'm, this, I'm a kind of a project manager type person. I can get you from here to there without a lot of fluff. Mark and I are kindred spirits that way. He doesn't mince, mince words. Not a lot of fluff. He's pragmatic. Maybe a three in the Enneagram. He's assertive. He doesn't waste time. Mark uses a word or a variation of immediately 36 times. Now is the time. Right away, they left their nets at that very moment. 36 times of this movement, really fast. Mark also marks time and place. John was in the wilderness. Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Jesus went back to Capernaum. Jesus crossed the late lake again. Jesus went through the wheat fields. Jesus returned to the synagogue, up to the mountain, entered a house. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown very early in the morning. You get my drift. You always know where Jesus is in the Gospel of Mark. You know where he's been and where he's going. So where are we now? The palm, palm branches we waved on Sunday are in the floorboard of our car. Stan, in that robing room, there's an old palm branch laying on that sofa, by the way. I said, here's my sermon right here. Some are still laying around in the narthex, probably, or strewn throughout the children's Sunday school classrooms. Some of those palm branches might have made it home. They're sitting on the island in your kitchen, ready to go to the trash any day. How quickly we forget. How quickly we forget. So as we turn toward this final week, the Pharisees and Sadducees have not forgotten. They're out to trick this guy, Jesus. They ask about paying taxes to Caesar, and we hear that famous phrase, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but we don't usually remember what comes after that? His reply left them overcome with wonder. They asked questions about the resurrection and the poor woman who won't have a husband after the resurrection. And Jesus admonishes them and says, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know your scriptures. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living that trickery didn't work. So they send in the legal expert or the scribe in your translation. 
Which commandment is the most important of all, asks this lawyer. And Jesus replies with the Shema. What we know from Deuteronomy, hear, O Israel, listen up, people. Our God is the one Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then Jesus adds, the second is this. In my translation, it says, you will love your neighbor. No other commandment is greater than these. The legal expert responds rightly. Well said, teacher, he says, you have truthfully said that God is the one and there is no one besides this. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you aren't far from God's kingdom. And no one dared ask any more questions. I don't think... This is the reaction they expected. Some of you have probably heard uh, the answer Frederick Beekner, one of my favorite writers, says that they expected. He says, when Jesus said to love your neighbor, a lawyer who was present asked him to clarify what he meant by neighbor. He wanted a legal definition that he could refer to in case the question of loving one ever happened to come up. He presumably wanted something on the order of a neighbor here and after referred to as the party of the first part is to be construed as meaning a person of Jewish descent whose legal residence is within a radius of no more than three statute miles from one's own legal residence unless there's another person of Jewish descent here and after to be referred to as the party of the second part living closer to the party of the first part than one is oneself. In which case, the party of the second part is to be construed as neighbor to the party of the first part, and one is oneself relieved of all responsibility of any sort or kind whatsoever. This is not the answer Jesus gave. And in Mark's gospel, the lawyer responded well, leaving the legalists dumbfounded. So what I want to do the rest of our time together is I want to talk about neighbor. Jesus talks about neighbor in this week. Just kind of bookend that. Not the one three cubic feet from you, but your neighbor. Again, Beekner in his book, Whistling in the Dark, said, if we are to love our neighbors before doing anything else, We must see our neighbors with our imagination as well as our eyes. That is to say, like an artist, we must see not just their faces, but the life behind and within their faces. Here it is, love, that is the frame we see them in. During this Lenten season, if we do nothing else, nothing else, I pray that we find time to see our neighbor. A few years ago, Discipleship Ministries introduced this great campaign called See All the People. It was wonderful. It was energetic and upbeat and encouraged all of us to see our neighbor, to see not some of the people but all of the people. The church I served in Houston always took their high school youth downtown several times a year, and and they served a meal to the homeless. It wasn't a buffet, but it was served. And they set up tables with white tablecloths under the bridge. And youth would play music from string quartets to rock and roll, like a restaurant. So imagine yourself at a little French bistro with violins or at hard rock cafe with electric guitars. The students would set the stage for the homeless. The youth were then invited after they served them to sit with those that they had served and listen to their stories. 
I'll never forget one homeless man turning to a 14-year-old and saying, no one ever talks to me. They don't even make eye contact. They try to pretend they don't see me because if they don't really see me, I don't really exist. But you, you sit with me. You serve me, you talk with me, and you look me in the eye when you do. That teenager was changed forever. She saw her neighbor. Friends, there's a whole world of neighbors out there that need to be seen, that need to know the love of Jesus, and we may be as close as they ever come. If we are to love our neighbors before doing anything else, we must first see our neighbors. We cannot pretend they don't exist. Now, I know I'm as guilty as they come. I'm too busy. I'm in a hurry. I miss seeing my neighbor. Now, we often make assumptions about our neighbors. It's what's referred to, I learned this recently, fundamental attribution error. That sounds like a fancy word, doesn't it, or a set of words? It's when you have this cognitive bias and you assume a person's actions depend on what kind of person they really are rather than on the social and environmental forces that influence the person. An example of that would be that because I'm Hispanic, I don't speak English or I don't have command of the language. Or all Republicans are racist and all Democrats are corrupt. Think about our current denominational situation. Traditionalists hate gay people and progressives don't know their Bible. Generalizations such as these are dangerous and could not be further from the truth. Jesus didn't say, be careful who you call your neighbor. Your black neighbor won't like you because you're white, or your white neighbor won't like you because you're black or brown or Asian. Remember, Jesus said, you will love your neighbor. He didn't say consider loving your neighbor or, you know, think about it and weigh out the possibilities. No. Jesus said, you will love your neighbor. And that means not just the one next door, but and most especially the ones we don't see or the one we choose to not see or pretend not to see. Because if I don't see you, you don't exist. There's a few days left in this Lenten season. So I'm going to ask you in these few days left, and I'm going to pray that you might make it a point today, now, to see your neighbor. Reach out to them. Don't assume the worst in them because they live on the corner of lovers and 75. Don't engage your fundamental attribution theory. In the words of Mark, the time is now, right away. This very moment is ours. It's ours. It's not too late. Imagine for just a millisecond the shift that will occur in our communities because we see our neighbor. We hear their story, not just with our ears, but with our heart. And with our imagination, as well as our eyes, that is to say like artists, we must see not just their faces, but the life behind and within their faces. Here it is, Beekner says, love. Here it is, love, that is the frame that we see them in. No commandment is greater. You will love 
your neighbor. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Bishop Harvey, for that inspiring message. I know I'll be trying hard to see my neighbor over the next few days and hopefully for many days to come. Uh, diving deep into those great commandments is, just warms my heart and my soul. And thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, I, I, I think Babs and Art are probably looking down on us right now with big smiles on their face. They're pleased and they're probably saying, wow, whoever picked that speaker did a good job couple of reminders. Uh, we're having a um, sit-down buffet lunch in Watson Hall right after our conclusion here. Uh, there are some take-home options. If you need to get back to work, you can grab one of those and take with you. Um, we'll have a little question and answer session after the bishop gets a chance to eat a little bit, so uh, be thinking about any questions you might have for her, knowing that she's the president of the Council of Bishops. You know, she might have some interesting things to tell us. And don't forget, we'll be here tomorrow, same time, noon, same place. Today we dove deep into the great commandment, and tomorrow we'll be diving even deeper into the servant of all. So our hymn that we're going to close with is uh, 648. Sh uh, Cheryl asked me to make sort of one change in the hymnal. Um, if you want to pull it out and... Um, in your pew. It's 648 and at the very bottom of that page in uh, stanza number two it says pastors learn and there's an asterisk beside pastors. She wants us to you know fitting for the day she wants us to substitute people learn. So will you please stand as you're able and join us in our closing hymn God the Spirit Guide and Guardian Hymn 648 in our hymnal.
as you prepare to go from this place, I pray that you will love your neighbor and that you will see your neighbor for all the good that they are and all that they bring to our world. So as you go now, go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.